As crazy as this sounds, World War III isn't that far away. Almost all of the major governments are predicting it, with heads of the US military claiming that we're the closest we've ever been to a major global conflict. The first two world wars left their permanent mark on the world and its people forever, and 75 years since the recovery of World War II, and the average citizen lives in relative peace, comfortable and content with life as it is. But the truth is that the world is peaceful until the day it isn't anymore, and that day may be much closer than it seems. And although it might not appear like it, the beginnings of World War III may already have been written in history. Now historically there's been a lot of close calls. Because it's no secret that the world is at a boiling point right now, global tensions haven't been this high in decades, but even during the relative peace of the last 80 years, there have been some major causes for alarm. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear war, only ending after an agonizing standoff. Other Cold War conflicts like Vietnam and the Korean War threatened to spill over into a global conflict, but luckily never did. In 1983, the USSR's missile warning system had a malfunction and reported attack from the US, and was luckily saved by one Russian man's gun instinct, after suspecting it was a glitch and not passing up the warning to the chain of command. Billions of people around the world owe their lives to him for this, because we've been inches from catastrophe multiple times in just the past century, but so far we've narrowly avoided it. Although the next time we might not be so lucky, historical trends and pressures are pushing the world closer to a boiling point. If you take a look at the past 400 years of history, you'll notice an alarming pattern. Conflicts between great powers happen with regularity almost like clockwork. Each of these wars had their own reasons, but the political scientist Graham T. Allison theorized that all of them are unified by the struggle of an emerging power with a dominant one. And he gave 16 historical examples of this happening, with 12 ending in war. In the World Wars, for example, the emerging power of Germany ran up against the hegemon of Britain, France, and the USA. Long periods of peace only came once the question is answered for good and one power is dominant. This has most recently been the USA, but before it was Britain or Rome. But what's concerning today is that we're about to see yet another example of this process in action. China has been an emerging power for decades, but with recent military expansion, they're finally looking ready to challenge the title. With their 2049 plan to be the world hegemon, this directly threatens the US's stability. And what's even more disturbing is that the other players in the game also seem rather familiar. The web of alliances and power blocks we see today are incredibly reminiscent of the world in 1913. China, just like Germany, seems dead set on disturbing the world order. Meanwhile, the stagnating power of Japan watches nervously from across the sea. But when you talk about World War III, most people will rightfully look straight at Russia. Because without the security of the Soviet system of buffer states, Russia's mentality has been sent back 100 years. Their regime lives in constant fear of a war across its massive, continent-stretching borders. And to cope with this and consolidate his own power, Putin has turned back the clock to the days of the Tsar, trying to rejuvenate the national spirits of Russia by invading Ukraine. Now there are many reasons for this. Ukraine was always a part of the Russian Empire for centuries, and over this time relations between the two peoples varied. But fears of separatism and an independence movement led to a whole host of anti-Ukrainian policies over the last few years. But under the USSR, Ukraine suffered the most. Soviet policies created a man-made famine called the Holodomor in the early 1930s, which killed up to 7.5 million Ukrainians. But just a few decades later and Russia is back looking to reclaim its lost glory at any cost, with Putin's official line being that Russia had to invade in order to buffer NATO's aggression. And this coincides with Putin's plans to shift Russian society further towards militarism. From 2021 to 2023, Russia's military budget has increased by 40% and in January of 2023, Putin ordered the size of Russia's western military to be increased to 1.5 million men. Although so far the war is going awfully, and international sanctions are severely damaging Russia's economy, with just the first week of the invasion cutting Russia's oil exports by 25%. In fact, it looks like Russia could collapse within 10 years. Because if the Russians see this as an existential conflict, and they know they can't hold a match to NATO, the nukes are their only option. The primary reason why everyone in the West has sh gotten shoulder to shoulder on this is they know that if Ukraine falls and Poland's next, there will be a direct fight, the Russians will lose, and then there will be a general nuclear exchange. With this putting all the more pressure for Putin to take over Ukraine, because if he folds, all of his political power will come crashing down. And now there's other time pressures as well, with both Finland and Sweden becoming incredibly close to full NATO membership, which will put even more pressure on Russia's western border, completely opening up their northern flank in the case of a war. Which is why tensions have risen dramatically, and it's getting to the point that the spillover from the war in Ukraine could trigger a much larger war. This will also spring great changes to the front line of the Ukraine war, and either side making ground would only increase tension 
tensions. However, whilst the Ukraine war might be the most obvious source of a world war, it unfortunately isn't the only way a global conflict could begin. Because China and its increased aggression towards Taiwan could easily start a conflict that would soon snowball into a world war. You see, China's government has always been marked by powerful resentment ever since they lost Taiwan in the Civil War. Their bitter ideological enemies, the nationalists of Taiwan, took the island and have always been a thorn in China's side since. But it goes beyond finishing an old grudge. Taiwan is a greater part of China's plan for global and economic dominance. And so it's important that we talk about China's 2049 plan. Now, the 2049 plan is the term used for China's geopolitical grand strategy. For Mao, who designed it, this meant industrializing and modernizing China's economy and institutions regardless of the cost. But after decades of meteoric growth, China has now moved on to phase two, expanding its sphere of influence. And this shift came during the mid 2010s, when China began a slew of new measures to use their new power. First, they made predatory investments into developing countries in Asia and Africa. Through these deals, China's engaged in a new type of modern economic colonialism, sucking resources out of these countries to fuel their own economy. And by using this new economic strength, China has then ramped up their military spending. Which is why from 2018, China has increased their military budget by over 28%. And in China, this money buys much more than that in the West, due to the much lower labor costs. In comparison, the US's defense budget has actually decreased by 4% in the same time span, when adjusting for inflation. And you see, this is all for a reason. This military spending directly corresponds with their preparation for a coming war with the US, likely beginning with an invasion of Taiwan, with almost all geopolitical strategists understanding that the South China Sea will be the catalyst for World War III. And that's why China's put loads of focus on their naval warfare. I mean, recently China surpassed the US in having the largest navy. And whilst the quality of these ships may not be up to par, quantity has a quality of its own. And one of their new projects has been the construction of artificial military islands in the disputed South China Sea. From these islands, which often host air bases, warehouses, ports, and military installations, China will be able to choke a trade route that sees $5 trillion in goods every year. They've also increased their offensive range, giving them ability to threaten American allies like the Philippines and Japan. All of this, amongst many things, has completely destroyed relations between China and the US, who are now engaged in an escalating trade war. But today, everybody's focused on Taiwan, because China has openly been aggressive to Taiwan, completely surrounding the country with jets, and preparing to storm the presidential building, with the Chinese government promising to invade and annex the island as part of their One China policy. So in response, the US has tried to keep China uncertain on whether they would actually go to war over Taiwan. But recently, Biden announced that the US would step in directly in the event of an invasion. And so if China stays true to their 2049 plan, the Bible of the Communist Party, then a wider conflict with NATO is almost inevitable. Although if you ask someone 10 years ago how World War III would start, you might think North Korea would be sure to come up in the conversation. However, nowadays, the Korean Peninsula's potential to erupt has been overlooked by the media and public, in favor of focusing on Russia and China themselves. But nothing has actually changed since then to make North Korea any less of a threat. In fact, their potential to start a third world war has only grown over the past decade. King Jong Un's regime is the most totalitarian government on the planet. Everyone knows this. State controls everything from the military to the media, even down to what haircut people can have. And this authoritarian control is sustained by relentless propaganda, thought control, and a system of generational prison camps. In North Korea's twisted system, you can be incarcerated for life in a modern gulag for crimes that your grandparents committed. And these pressures have forced a nationalistic, aggressive doctrine into the populace, making them comfortable with the idea of war against the West. But what's more concerning about North Korea is their nuclear program. Ever since North Korea developed nuclear capabilities in 2006, they've been using them as a part of their saber-rattling arsenal. But what have so far been idle threats could soon turn into action if the North Korean regime ever feels legitimately threatened. I mean, what's to stop King Jong-un pushing the button if any other country tries to free their people? Especially if China uses North Korea as a puppet in the case of invading Taiwan. Which is why North Korea has massively increased their missile tests to demonstrate this threat, launching nearly 90 missiles in 2022 alone, some of which are even capable of reaching the mainland United States. It's these capabilities for mass destruction, and the fact that North Korea is a complete puppet of China, which makes North Korea one of the most likely future sources for a global conflict. Whether it's in 10 days or 10 years, when World War III really does happen, it will set the course of history for the next century. But this is the most important question. Who's going to be on each side? We've already seen how new age conflict can affect everyone, not just those in battle. The invasion of Ukraine sent prices of essential goods and energy skyrocketing and erased trillions of dollars from investment accounts, with losses comparable to the 2008 financial crash. So we're all left wondering, I'm diversified, why is my portfolio still getting wiped out? We're not diversified in the right way. See, Goldman Sachs released a shocking report saying the classic stock bond strategy won't be enough to keep investors afloat, having lost around 25% last year. So what do they recommend you do in order to salvage your stolen returns? Investing in real assets like fine art. It's surprising, but Goldman says fine art can protect your purchasing power even in times like these. 
Now you're thinking, that's great, but how can I benefit? With Masterworks, whose 11Xs have each returned a profit to their investors. See, Masterworks' platform lets you invest in contemporary art from legends like Picasso and Bansky, but for a fraction of the full price. We've talked about them for over a year, and if you're already signed up, you would have seen another 2Xs as recently as last month, for an amazing 10 and 35% net returns. No wonder paintings have sold out in less than an hour, and Masterworks even had to make a waitlist for signups. But use the link below and you'll be able to skip that waitlist immediately. Of course, a lot would depend on how the war actually starts. In a scenario where Russian aggression towards the West triggers a war, their survival would hinge on getting two key allies involved, Iran and China. You see, Iran has enjoyed the same shoddy reputation in the West as Russia as they're obviously no friend of the US. I mean, the whole government came into being after overthrowing the pro-US regime and ever since the two countries have been at each other's throats. Getting into the complex and bloody story would be way too much for this video, but it's safe to say they're no friends of the US at all and would happily ally with Russia or China if they thought they stood a chance. As recently, they've upgraded the corporation, with Russia exchanging military technology for attack drones to be used in Ukraine. However, Iran's cooperation with China is a little more uncertain. After Xi Jinping's visit to Saudi Arabia, China seems to be taking their side in the Middle East Cold War. But when push comes to shove, Iran's vendetta against the West runs much deeper than the spat with China. But Russia also has other allies, although they're not even close to being superpowers. I mean, Belarus, for example, has assisted Russia in their invasion of Ukraine, letting Russian troops use their borders to attack. Russia has also friends in Central Asia, countries that fall within the old Soviet sphere of influence. However, China is the main prize and would be tricky for Russia to convince in the event of a war. Or at least it seems that way, because the two nations seem perfectly suited for a circumstantial alliance, but they don't have any formal military pacts yet. And this is because it isn't in China's interest to show their hand. A war between Russia and the US would destabilize their delicate trading balance, forcing them to give up one trading partner or the other. The US stands a much better chance of damaging China's maritime trade, which is a major deterrent to Chinese aggression or alliance with Russia. But China's Belt and Road Initiative has been eroding this weakness, because for the last couple of decades, China's been doing everything they can to destabilize the US's reigning power over the world. And that's why more of China's imports arrive by train now rather than boat. And while China deals with their economic vulnerabilities and develops their military, they're getting more and more likely to join Russia in an all-out war. China from the beginning has said that it will back up Russia. It will be Russia's ally because it wants to be a counterweight to American power in the world. For all its song and dance about its neutrality on the world stage, China has made its choice, siding with Russia against Ukraine. China would be happy to seize any any chance they're given to upset the status quo if the timing is right. And if they did, China could definitely expect support from North Korea. The isolationist dictatorship is effectively a Chinese vassal, and they've already given their full support to China's claims on Taiwan. In fact, the whole of North Korea is only sustained by China itself. The whole regime would collapse if it wasn't for China. And time is also buying China more and more allies as the years go by. The new RCEP trade pact ties them to a free trade deal with pretty much the rest of the Pacific trading nations. And as this develops, the question of who is to side with who will get harder for many nations that aren't firm friends of the US to begin with. But the ultimate nightmare scenario for the West is a China-Russia-Iran coalition, but an active military relationship is doubtful. History does tell us that an economic and political alliance is much more likely than a military one. For example, during World War II, collaboration between Japan and Germany was incredibly limited, despite grand proclamations at diplomatic summits. Mexico will also pay an incredibly undervalued role in a future conflict. So far, they've taken a neutral stance on the war in Ukraine, and have actually enjoyed good relations with Russia, being one of the only countries to adopt the Sputnik vaccine. And their alliance with the US isn't a foregone conclusion. Even though the US is Mexico's biggest trading partner, it's very likely that Russia will exploit Mexican neutrality or their ties with drug cartels to disrupt the US, rather than opening up a Northern American front. As for the West, they can count on lots of different alliances around the world. Every member of NATO would be expected to fight. An attack on one member is an attack on all members after all. And this means that the Russia would have to contend with the US, the UK, most of the European Union, including France and Germany, and crucially Turkey. And you see Turkey's had the best relations with Russia, but NATO would force their hand in the event of a clear Russian aggression. The US's other allies would also likely get involved like Japan, Australia and the Philippines. And in a war against China, the US could expect the same allies as against Russia with a few key differences. Obviously Japan and Australia would play a much larger role in the conflict, acting as the US's two bastions in the Pacific. Military cooperation has increased in recent years, with the announcement of the AUK-US Pact, which is the US, the UK and Australia promising to work on increasing their military presence in the Pacific, with the crowning jewel of the treaty being a fleet of nuclear subs for deployment off of Australia's coast. As for other allies, the Philippines wouldn't be tempted to sell out to the US after decades of friendship. India will also play a pivotal role, as relations between India and China have been rocky to say the least, with there being lots of border skirmishes as the two growing powers rub against one another, with India being very wary of China's close relations to Pakistan, India's biggest enemy, and recent trade imbalances only serve to poison the relationship even further. And so through this specific alliance, the US hopes to choke out China's trade and ability to project maritime power. Whether this will work is a whole other story. So if World War III breaks out, what are the weapons that are going to be 
be used. While the sooner the war happens, the more the weapons will resemble what we see today, particularly in the war in Ukraine. You see, one of the most obvious things that we can learn from Ukraine is the prevalence and importance of missiles. Using them, Russia has kept up an almost non-stop bombardment of key Ukrainian infrastructure. In the future, we will see massive advances in missile technology, and likewise in missile defense. Anti-tank missile launchers are also seeing lots of use in Ukraine, exposing a massive weakness of tanks to infantry ambushes, with analysis estimating that Russia has lost over 1,400 tanks, many as a result of Western anti-tank personnel weapons, like the Javelin or the NLAW. Future missiles are also likely to employ much more advanced guidance technology, such as AI, because even today, South Korea is fitting their attack helicopters with AI-guided air-to-surface missiles. Drones are also a very common sight in Ukraine, with the obvious strengths being that they're very hard to detect and even harder to shoot down, which is very effective for Ukraine to drop grenades on infantry. And as drone technology progresses, they will be able to carry heavier payloads, meaning we're only just seeing the beginning of drone warfare. The first attempts to weaponize airplanes saw pilots dropping objects like grappling hooks out of their cockpits. This then developed into mountain guns and actual bombs, so drones may follow the same pattern of development. But overall, the related idea of autonomous killer robots is to boot. But if the war gets desperate, then advances in this field may be inevitable. I mean, Russia's already been testing their own AI-driven robotic tanks. The URAN-9 is a fully autonomous ground vehicle equipped with a 30mm autocannon, among many other weapons. But if the war happens further in the future, we're likely to see weapons that only existed before in sci-fi. The US has already begun fitting their ships with laser beam weapons. Although these aren't very powerful yet, the XN-1 LAWS has only really been tested against enemy drones rather than ships. However, laser weapons do have a key advantage over conventional arms, as they won't cost nearly as much per shot. And as the power levels of these lasers increase, they will soon be able to shoot down incoming missiles as well. And whilst the US is focused on lasers, China is building their own rail guns. They rely on using electromagnetics to accelerate a non-explosive kinetic payload at up to seven times the speed of sound, and this gives them a much longer range than conventional artillery, ranges that are only reachable by missiles today. But a railgun shot is much less expensive, considering the lack of explosives. And so with both of these options, the battlefield will change irreversibly. Both of these advancements the same as larger and stronger swords were 500 years ago. You see, instead, robotic warfare promises the same drastic changes to the nature of war as gunpowder did, because combat robots are incredibly attracted to militaries, as they drastically reduce casualties, making their use in battle almost risk-free. The only loss would be financial and possibly technological if the enemy managed to recover the drone. Robot soldiers also don't have moral issues. These drones are purely logical and will always perfectly follow orders. Now obviously there will be major ethical problems, but regimes around the world have never really had much trouble with this. They don't care that they're autonomous killing machines. All they care about is winning the war. At first, these robot soldiers would be a gradual introduction, with only the most dangerous and suited jobs getting outsourced. I mean, the US is currently working on an automated sentry turret that would take over the role of the rear guard in retreat. And over time, if it's economically viable, armed forces around the world will soon replace their human fighting machines with real ones. In fact, this has already started. The first recorded kill of a person by an autonomous drone happened in 2020. And by looking at the development of Boston Dynamics and the future progression of robot soldiers, this doesn't seem too far-fetched. And if this becomes adapted in a World War III scenario, this will then bring about a whole new wave of countermeasures. Because as this develops, we're likely to see in-combat demonstrations of hacking and sabotage Defense systems will be shut down. GPS could be interfered with. Enemy robotics could even be reprogrammed and made to see their allies as enemies. But technological warfare also offers things that have only been provided so far by carpet bombing or outright occupation so far in history. Medical and power infrastructure could be severely disrupted by cyber attacks, which could bring a centralized country's war effort to a standstill for days or even weeks at a time. And as the infrastructure becomes even more centralized, this problem will only get worse. For example, Elon Musk's Starlink may sound like a good idea in peacetime, but relying on this in war would leave countries a few destroyed satellites away from chaos. I mean, rogue actors are already using this to shut down hospitals or leak intelligence, and so it's only a matter of time before we see desperate or unethical governments adopt these methods. And we're only talking about the conventional methods of disrupting a country's ability to fight. I mean, even in peacetime, China and Russia have used social media to manipulate the people of foreign countries. They could even stop a war before it starts by pushing anti-war sentiments and hit pieces on Facebook or TikTok, with state-owned platforms like TikTok having the very real potential to push propaganda and unrest around a country. This is a new type of warfare that the world hasn't seen. And once countries master this new type of social media warfare, they can then make entire populaces much more willing to fight, or sapping the strength of the enemy's will. I mean, Russia and China have been practicing and building up their capabilities for years on this front. And it seems like the West has a lot of catching up to do. But even all these present and future technologies ignore the elephant in the room, nuclear weapons. If World War III becomes a total war, there's no saying how long it would take before nuclear weapons are used. Mutually assured destruction has kept countries from pushing the big red button for years. 
years. But all of this goes out of the window during wartime. If Xi, Putin or King Jamun saw their regime crumbling around them, it's a big leap of faith to believe that they wouldn't turn to their nuclear arsenals. But even with this threat, it's not hard to see a war still breaking out. It will just look a lot different to those previous world wars. With World War III potentially seeing much more limited front lines and much more emphasis placed on infrastructure disruption and economic pressure. Both Russia and China's war goals encourage this model. Both seem set on the occupation of specific countries rather than some grand plan for world dominance. Putin's Russia may not want to stop a Ukraine, but with the current pace things are going, any dreams of reuniting the Russian Empire won't come to fruition anytime soon. And any greater European war would look much more like an expanded war in Ukraine, with Russia defending attacks from both Finland and other parts of Eastern Europe. Likewise, it seems like China is set on taking Taiwan, but there isn't much reason to go beyond the one China policy. Although what can be accomplished through occupation is much easier to gain through trade dominance and economic pressure. They would invade Taiwan, which would also have the effect of crippling the US's source of microchips, with things like microchips being the hidden war between the US and China right now. From Taiwan and their artificial islands, China would be able to suffocate trade in the Pacific, and so a war would likely revolve around who can control the shipping lanes, with the US pulling in Japan, Australia and other allies, with the ground war would likely being limited to Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula. If China could establish regional dominance, they would be able to get all of the resources they need without outright invading Southeast Asia. And even though the Chinese Navy did surpass the US Navy in size in 2020, the US still possesses a dwindling technological advantage, adding in both side allies, and it looks like China isn't really ready for a war just yet. And unless America has other problems to worry about, a large-scale war in the Pacific would end very badly for the CCP and could undo decades of work increasing their soft power over Asia. Russia, on the other hand, poses a much more direct threat. The EU would struggle to hold out against an overwhelming offensive, but Russia would have to make quick and stable gains before the EU's economic superiority kicks in or before the US gets involved. And this means that the real danger period for the West will come in the next few years. And if the Chinese military can develop enough before Russia loses their edge, the US and the West could easily lose a war on two fronts. And so with all of this in mind, it should be clear that a future world war would threaten our very existence, and the people who order the invasions most likely will never experience the horrors that they will inflict. And like every war, it's the people who will lose their friends, their families, and their lives, regardless of the country that wins.